on the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Let the oil of gladness flow down from your throne. Put on Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good to see you on this happy Mother's Day. To all of our moms out there, we wish you a happy Mother's Day. For those who are watching online, we wish you a happy Mother's Day as well, welcoming you to our worship service this morning, inviting you to join us and to follow along with the listening guides and singing along with us as well. Uh, I want to just make a, a quick announcement to you. On your table are some vases and some roses that were provided for us by Ken and Tracy. And they decorated your tables this morning, yes. And Tracy wanted me to let you know that those are for you. If you would desire to take one of those home with you, uh, that you could do that in honor of our moms today and in honor of those women who have been influential over others as a mothering type of atmosphere. So those are for you to take home. Did I do that all right, Tracy? Is that, that all right? Okay. So... Uh, just make sure that you take one of those home if you'd like. Those are gifts and, uh, to honor our moms today and for the women who have been influential. Our memory verse from last week, Ephesians 5, 17. Anybody remember what it was? Be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Inside your bulletins on the front cover, on the very bottom, you'll see this week's memory verse. Proverbs 31, 30. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Let's say that together. Proverbs 31, 30. Oh, you weren't ready. Let's try that together. Here we go, ready? Proverbs 31, 30. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is passing. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Amen. Ladies, don't forget your book club is meeting uh, on Tuesdays at uh, 10 o'clock in the community room back there. 
See, Cheryl, if you have any questions about that, if you're not yet a part of that, ladies, and you would like to be, make sure that you touch base with Cheryl and find out the information you need for that. Let's get ready to worship the Lord this morning and uh, prepare our hearts and our minds to receive the word he has prepared for us. Well, Father, we come before you with thanksgiving in our hearts, rejoicing over the opportunity to gather together as your people, where, Father, that we can prepare our hearts to be open, our minds to be open, to receive a word that I believe that you have prepared for us. Father, we thank you for our moms. We thank you for the godly influence of mothers. We thank you for the roles that they play in the home as wives and as moms. And we ask you, Father, today a special blessing upon them. We ask you, Father, to help us to encourage them today. And Lord, as you bring forth your word, I pray that you'll help us to be encouraged as men and women to be the godly men and women you've called us to be. As we get ready this morning to worship you, Father, we want to just lift you up and adore you. We ask you, Father, to inhabit our praises. And may there be a fresh awareness of your presence in this place among your people as we sing to you and we listen to you. And it's in Christ's name we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. Worship team, come lead us. Well, happy Mother's Day. Let's stand and sing. May we mighty is our God.
mother were here today, this would be the song that she would want me to sing. But she's with the Lord now, and, and she's happy and blessed. But this song brings back uh, some long, long ago memories. The song was actually written in 1928. Uh, I don't think any of you have been around that long, but it is an oldie. But it's one that proclaims what we're all about today as we celebrate Mother's Day. And it's entitled, My Mother's Eyes. childhood days I can remember loving caresses showered on me mother's eyes would gaze at me so tender what was their meaning now I can see That taught me wrong from right I found in my mother's eyes Those baby tales she told That road all paved with gold I found in my mother's eyes Just like a wandering sparrow one lonely soul I walk the straight and narrow to reach my goal God's gift sent from above a real unselfish love I found in my mother's eyes when I'm all around me I find the future dark as can be sorrows I have known always surround me then through the shadows I'll always see <coughs> one bright and guiding that taught me wrong from right I found in my mother's eyes Those baby tales she told That road all paved with gold I found in my mother's eyes Just like a wandering sparrow one lonely soul I walk the straight and narrow to reach my goal God's gift sent from above a real unselfish love I found in my mother's If you've got your Bibles this morning, I invite you to join me in the book of Genesis, chapter 4. Genesis, chapter 4. Today is Mother's Day, a special day set aside to honor our moms. And again, we want to wish all of our mothers here and watching online a happy Mother's Day to you. 
Mother's Day is a day that was set aside back on uh, when Woodrow Wilson was president in 1914. He said that uh, May the 9th would be set aside for Mother's Day, uh, a day to express public uh, appreciation, love, reverence for our mothers across the country. And I can tell you that after all that moms do for us, that they certainly deserve to have a day set aside once a year at least, where we offer them uh, gifts and and praise, and phone calls, and hugs, and love, and all kinds of things that we give to them. Uh, if you're blessed to still have your mother with you, I want to encourage you, if you haven't done it already, make sure that you call her, or visit her today. Uh, but I want to talk to you a little bit this morning about the influence of a mother in the home, and, uh, and give us some encouragement to, to see what moms actually, and what kind of influence they have over the home, over our husbands, over their children. Uh, Abraham Lincoln said, no one is poor who had a godly mother. He went on to say, I remember my mother's prayers, and they have followed me. They have clung to me all my life. All that I am and hope to be, I owe to my angel mother. A mother's influence is of great importance to us. Now, they have such a major impact on our life. Have you ever thought about the role that your mother has played in your life uh, and the roles that she's fulfilled as you were growing up? Uh, I jotted down just a few this week. Just think about this for a moment. This list is certainly not exhaustive, but, uh, but it gives us a good idea. She's a nurse, a counselor, a spiritual advisor, an educator, uh, a nutritionist, an accountant, transportation center, maid, peacemaker, entertainer. Uh, these are just a few that I came up with in just a short period of time. Uh, our, roles, our mothers play such a, an important role in our lives. Uh, our mothers and our, our wives... Uh, they impact the home in a drastic way. This morning I want to point that out by, by making a reference to a woman that we know very little about. In fact, we know virtually nothing about her in the Bible. She's got a very, very brief mention in the Word of God, but that brief mention, she is the most talked about wife and mother in history. And uh, I want to just talk about her this morning. Chapter 4 of Genesis, verse 16 and 17 Verse 17 is the only reference to this woman in the Bible. Verse 16, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And he built a city and called the, the name of the city after his son Enoch. We don't know nothing about her, but I believe that one little reference, Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. I believe that one single reference in the Bible may show us the enormous role uh, a wife and a mother play in the home. Now, I want you to understand something about Cain's wife. She was not a perfect wife, and she certainly was not a perfect mother. Uh, she, like a lot of women, she had a past. If you got your listening, guys, you notice the first thing we see about her is her past. Her past today would be, if you and I were to, to be talking about her in modern day, it would be considered scandalous uh, and shameful. I mean, we... We wouldn't just talk about her, we would really talk about her. Uh, the identity of Cain's wife is probably one of the most persistent questions posed by people that study the early chapters of Genesis. Many skeptics would even take this passage and take Cain's wife and try to dismantle the Word of God and say, well, it can't actually be uh, trusted to be the Word of God if you answer the question, who is Cain's wife, the way that the Bible implies you have to answer it. Many people, this would be a stumbling block for many people to answer this question. They don't accept the creation story that God began with one man and one woman. In fact, many would say to you today uh, that, uh, that even though that's what the infallible, inspired Word of God says, many, of you would, many people today would say, well, that's, that's just simply not possible uh, for Cain to have met his wife. Uh, you know, there, there had to have been other people on the earth besides Adam and Eve. Now, I've got to be honest with you. Every time that somebody asks me, Preacher, where did Cain get his wife? My answer is always the same. From her mother. But, uh, but where did she come from? Where did Cain get his, his wife from? Well, uh, the Bible tells us that, uh, that, that Cain's wife came from the same mother as Cain. Uh, after Cain murdered his brother Abel, we'll get into the story in a moment, but you remember that, uh, that Abel was the other son of Adam and Eve, and Cain rose up and killed his brother Abel. 
And, uh, and he did so in a jealous rage. The Bible says that after Cain killed Abel, that Adam and Eve had another son. His name was Seth. And then after Seth was born, we drop down to chapter 5 and verse 4 of Genesis. It says that Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters. We don't know how many sons and daughters they had. They had many sons and daughters. I mean, Adam lived to be 800 years old. Uh, so we don't know how many they had, but it's very obvious that the sons of Adam and Eve had to marry the daughters of Adam and Eve and to have children if they were going to honor the Lord's command to be fruitful and multiply. And so Cain's wife was his sister. Uh, to many that makes her past tainted. In fact, the idea, the whole idea of that just causes us to shudder. In fact, the whole idea of this, if we conclude that Cain's wife was his sister, many of us say, man, I just, I just can't do that. I just can't go there. Uh, but you've got to consider some things. You and I have to consider at this time in history, at this time at the very beginning, uh, Cain's sisters were the only women available besides his mother. And so many people would say, well, you know, I just, I still can't go there. Well, Cain's wife was a descendant of Adam, just like you and I are descendants of Adam. Uh, and the fact of the matter is that many people will immediately reject this, say, wait a minute. Now, I can, I can tell you right now, the Bible is false because <coughs> if Cain married his sister, the Bible says in Leviticus that there is a law against marrying your relatives, your brothers and sisters. Now, there's a few problems with that theory. If you say that you can't marry your relation, uh, well, actually, if you don't marry your relation, you can't marry another human. Because the Bible tells us that we are all related. In fact, a wife is related to her husband long before they're ever married because the Bible tells us in Acts that we are all of one blood and we are all descendants of Adam and Eve. So we're all, in reality, brothers and sisters. We are all connected in that way. Secondly, you know, if you want to go and, and talk about the law, you've you got to remember, you're talking about a law that didn't come into existence for 2,500 more years. So from the time of creation until the time of Moses, uh, that was not the law, and that was, and was not uh, uh, a disobedient act of God's to marry your relatives. In fact, uh, if, if the man, if it was one man and one woman for marriage, as Genesis points out that it should be, there is no disobedience to God's law at all. In, in the case of Adam, uh, in the case of Cain and his wife, you got to remember they are children of Adam and Eve who were perfect creations uh, that God had made, and they could not have had any kind of genetic disorder because they were made perfectly. Cain and his wife's relationship was a marriage between a brother and a sister in the first generation level of humans, and therefore it was, they were without genetic disorders. And so when Adam and Eve were created, the Bible says that they were perfect. God said everything that he made was good, and uh, the, that means their genes were perfect. There were no mistakes, and God had commanded them to go forth and be fruitful and multiply. Now, when sin entered into the world because of Adam, something did change. Something began to happen back then. Uh, God cursed the world so that perfect creation then began to deteriorate and, and to suffer death and decay. Uh, but Cain and his wife, again, were in the first generation of children who were ever born, and he as well as his brothers and sisters would have received, if you will, virtually no imperfect genes from Adam and Eve, and since the effect of sin and the curse was so early on, it had not been experienced yet. And so Cain's wife is his sister, and the Bible t teaches that, that back then that's what they had to do, is marry their brothers and sisters to uh, be fruitful and multiply. Now, Cain's wife was also the first wife in the fallen world. Now, Adam and Eve, Eve was a wife of Adam, but Cain, was the first, or Cain took on the first wife in the fallen world. Uh, Cain's wife was a, that's the reason why we talk about her so much, because we don't talk about Seth or Methuselah or Jared or any of these other guys, where they get their wives, because Cain's wife was the first wife. We, we all the time are, are uh, very uh, enthralled with the question, where did Cain get his wife? And so we talk about her a lot. Now, because Cain's wife is the first wife in the fallen world, 
We can't talk about Cain's wife without first having a little bit of a conversation about Cain. And so we're going to sidestep Cain's wife for just a minute to talk about her husband because he is a very important character in the Bible. Uh, in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, there's a whole bunch of firsts that happen. Uh, Cain and, and Abel were the first sons of Adam and Eve. Therefore, Cain being the firstborn, he was the first one conceived out of sexual intercourse in the world. He is the first child. Adam and Eve also had a son named Abel. You know, it's an interesting fact. A lot of Bible scholars think that Cain and Abel may have been twins. Now, there's no scriptural support for that. And there's no scriptural argument against that. They simply go there because she conceived and she had Cain. Then there's no, con no uh, subject about conceiving anybody. And then Abel shows up. Well, we don't know if they were twins or not. What we do know is that Cain is the firstborn. Abel was second. Cain killed Abel, making Cain the first murderer on the earth. Cain murdered his brother Abel in a jealous rage. Now, how did this happen? What happened? What, what's going on with it? Uh, this would have happened when the boys and the men, about 129 years old at this time. Genesis chapter 4 tells us that these young men, in the process of time, they brought an offering to God. Now, that's a very important word. That word brought is a very important term because it indicates that there was an appointed time and an appointed place to come and to worship the Lord. Uh, this would indicate that they were doing so by revelation. Somebody says, well, what revelation? Well, certainly Adam and Eve had sat the boys down and told them about the events of the garden and how God had killed an animal to cover their shame and to, uh, to cover them up and, and that they were to uh, exercise bringing offerings before the Lord in this manner. Uh, maybe the Lord himself had a conversation or revealed to Adam or to Cain and Abel what was to happen. Uh, however, or whoever delivered the revelation, uh, we know from Hebrews that they were coming by revelation because it says that by faith Abel's offering was made to God, made a more excellent offering to God, and Cain did not. Well, the question has to be asked then: How did Abel know how to bring a more excellent offering? or to bring the offering he had. And I mean, how did he know to come by faith? Well, the Bible tells us that, that uh, so by faith coming, uh, comes hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So it's an important point for you and I to see that the two boys, two men, brought their offerings and the kind of offerings that they brought before the Lord because it's an implication of the character of Cain. Uh, Jude describes how people will live in this latter days, in our day, in our time. He describes how people will live, he, and he calls it the way of Cain. This describes Cain's life to a T. It uh, is perfectly, it describes the life of those who live by flesh and not by faith. It describes the, the, the characteristics of all those who refuse to live according to God's word and God's will. In fact, the ways of Cain are this. The ways of Cain tell us that, that when Cain brought his offering before the Lord, he was basically saying to God, I brought you the fruit of the ground, or I brought you what I did. Here it is. Uh, there is no evidence of faith. There's, there's no pointing to the promise of God. There's no evidence of preparation. Cain's offering simply said, I know what you said, but here's what I did, and you can take it or you can leave it. There's... Cain's offering was an act of false worship. Basically, he said, uh, my way will work just as well as the way that God told us to do it. Uh, I, can, I can have my way, and God will like it. He found out instantly it didn't work that way because God immediately judged him for it and rejected his offering. But Cain was merely following a form of religion, if you will. There's no love in his heart for God. There's no gratitude to God for his blessings. And by the way, this is a great caution for you and I today. Because the fact of the matter is that uh, this is how a lot of people attend worship service today. There are people in churches all across the world today attending church in this way. There's no faith. There's no preparation. There's no gratitude to God. There, there's no love for God in their heart. They are simply in the church building, sitting down, saying, Here I am, God, and you better be glad I even made the effort. Was there anything wrong with Cain's offering? I don't think so. I, I, I think that uh, the issue wasn't the offering. 
I think that Cain's offering probably would have won first place in any county or state fair. I think it probably was just that good. He was that good of a farmer, maybe. Uh, it wasn't the offering. It was the manner in which the offering was made. It was not made by faith. Uh, look, Cain, uh, Abel brought a faith offering. Cain brought a flesh offering. It denied that human nature is evil. It denied that man is separated from God. You remember that when Adam and Eve sinned, what happened? God drove them out of the garden. And, uh, and they were put into, forced into eke out a meager existence and to uh, work the ground for their food. The, the, their lives changed drastically in every way. The days of walking in the cool of the garden with God were no more. But Cain wanted to act like so many act today. Cain wanted to act like, you know what? There's nothing wrong with the relationship between man and God. God's okay with man, and man's okay with God. There's, there's no big deal here. I mean, it, 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 shouldn't be, it shouldn't be any other kind of way. Look, the, the fact of the matter is, this is what liberalism does in the world today. The, the, the teaching of the universal fatherhood of God and the universal brotherhood of man it says, it says, you know what, there, there's nothing wrong between God and man. Everything is fine. My friend, I'm going to tell you this morning what you need to hear. Things are not all right between man and God. They haven't been all right between man and God since the first sin was committed. Man is separated from God, and God hates sin. And so Cain's offering implied that, you know what, man's work is, pl- is, is fine. You just bring your works, your good works before God, and he will be pleased. That's a fact that scripture uh, imminently uh, argues against. How is it that Cain got it so wrong and Abel got it so right? Uh, Both were raised in the same home, same background, same heredity, same environment. I'm going to tell you how. Because coming to God is an act of individual faith. You don't come on the coattails of your parents. You don't come on the coattails of your brothers or your sisters. Each each and every one of us comes to God by faith individually. And and you you can't, listen, there's a lot of people in the world today that think, well, you know what, I'm I'm coming to God and I'm entering into heaven. You know why? Because I I went to church. I joined a church. I I acted nice to people. I did good things. Hell is going to be full of people like that. Because you don't come to God that way. You come to God in faith, believing and trusting. And you say, what does all this have to do with Cain's wife? I'm so glad you asked that. Here's what it has to do with it. Husbands, sometimes you make life hard for your wife and your children's mothers. The way of Cain impacted Cain's wife. Everything that Cain was, everything that Cain did impacted her life too. Back in 1981, an attorney, Michael Milton, did a study on the monetary value of a wife and a mother in the home. He listed various functions that she performed. She's a chauffeur, gardener, family counselor, maintenance worker, cleaning woman, housekeeper, cook, errand runner, bookkeeper, budget manager, interior decorator, caterer, dietitian, secretary, public relations person, and a hostess. He listed all those things, and then he did the calculations, and back in 1981, he figured that the, 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 based on the labor market, she was worth about $786 a week or $41,000 a year. Well, certainly that uh, figure is much, much greater today. Using this impressive list, it, it shows us the value, but because of Cain's attitudes and because of Cain's actions of sin, uh, murdering his brother... God would set a mark upon Cain, and, and we don't know what that mark was, but it was enough to make him feel the, the, the wrath of God and fear the abhorrence of his fellow men. God then took Cain and drove him out of the land and removed him from his family. And you got to think, now wait a second. All of a sudden, Cain's wife shows up. Well, Cain's wife was already there when Cain was doing these things, and the bottom line is that Cain's wife didn't do anything to deserve any of that. Yet she is feeling everything that he's feeling. She felt the pain of her husband's actions. And there's a fundamental biblical truth here. That the condition of the heart determines the course of life. What is is seen in life externally 
is a revelation of the character of the heart internally. In Cain's life, sin demonstrated its control over him. We see it in his anger, in his jealousy, in his hatred, in his murder, in his lying. And all of those actions prove that Cain possessed an unredeemed heart. Men, hear me clearly this morning. The way that you and I honor our wives and the mother of our children is today and every day by living godly lives before them. Because what you do and who you are impacts your wife and the whole family. So many of the things that come to mind when I think of moms like love and strength and patience and grace and hope, joy, perseverance, and so much more, all these things and more represent the best qualities of our moms in our lives. But this morning, men, we need to realize and children need to realize that our wives and our mothers have needs too, like godly husbands who will live godly before them and encourage them to be godly women, and children who will raise up and respect their mothers and love their mothers. Cain's wife's past was impacted by Cain because she was related to him and because she was tied to him. But we got to face the fact that, that what, even though he wasn't all that he should have been as a husband, even though he wasn't all he should have been, we'll see, as a father, it didn't keep her from being a faithful wife. Notice, secondly, her partnership with him. When I'm looking at Cain's wife and I'm thinking about their situation, three things stand out to me that I think have to be considered. The first one is the fear of Cain. When God judges Cain, he tells him he's going to put a mark on him, he's going to drive him out of the land, he's going to make it difficult for him to, to farm the land. Cain says, oh, all this suffering is too much for me. People are going to pursue me. People are going to try to kill me. There's the fear of Cain. And, and in all the conversation that Cain has with God about this, not one time does he say, what about my wife? Oh, it's all about him. He's only worried about himself. Uh, who would somebody who would Cain have to fear? Well, in 130 years of having children, uh, Adam's creation and Abel's murder has gone by, and uh, there's a good many generations have raised up. In fact, most scholars would say by this time, there's, there's probably population is in the thousands. So he's got those who loved Abel that would maybe want to exact revenge on him. But you've got to consider the fear of Cain. He's, he's, he's looking for an escape. And then there's the future of Cain, you know, that, that uh, is impacted here. Cain is punished by God. God. The ground is cursed as a farmer to be devastating. He pays this high price for his sins. And all the days he lives in the world, he is banished from his home, from his family, consigned to a horrible, desperate uh, future of uh, existence, of wandering. Do you know, it's interesting, the name Cain appears in the Bible 27 times in 17 verses, only three times in the New Testament. And every single time in the New Testament Cain's name is mentioned, it is mentioned in a negative manner. What's all that tell us about Cain's wife? It certainly tells us about her faithfulness to Cain. Uh, wives are not responsible for their husband's actions. Wives are not responsible for their husband's attitudes, but they're impacted by them. Now, we know the Bible tells us that wives are to submit to their own husbands. Peter even suggests that the witness of the wife uh, can bring some husbands to salvation. I don't know, maybe it was through the encouragement and influence and example of Eve that Cain's wife was faithful to the Lord or to her husband. We, we don't really know. Maybe her partnership was more with God than it was with her husband. We simply don't know the answer to that, but whatever it was, we have to give her credit for her willingness to stay with her husband and share in his pain and his banishment. And I, I believe this speaks volumes to the final thing this morning. I want to see her power. Because I'm looking at Cain's wife, and I'm thinking when Cain and his wife settle down, uh, they have a son who they name Enoch. It's an important name because the word Enoch means dedicated. Uh, some scholars have, have pointed to this exact moment and said to the, to possibly concluded that suppose this may have marked a change in Cain's life also. Maybe a change in his character because the word dedicated is akin to the word train or train up like in Proverbs 26, train up a child. We have to ask the question, was this the, the power of influence of Cain's wife and, 
and the mother of his children? Uh, was Cain's wife a woman of great power and influence as so many mothers in our world are today and in this place are today? Uh, the, the truth of the matter is, it could be she was. I mean, the Bible doesn't say one way or the other about that. The Bible tells us nothing about the early years of Enoch. Uh, all we know is that when Enoch gets about 65 years old, he becomes a father himself, and his child is Methuselah. And, and we know that uh, after the child was born, we're told that Enoch began to walk with God, and he walked with God for the remaining 300 years of his life. What happened? Well, what happened to this whole family? Is the, this whole family is a picture of the opposite of that. But all of a sudden, we've got Enoch, a man who is walking with God. What was the, about the birth of Enoch? That, uh, that caused Enoch to come to faith in God. Could it have been the prayers of a faithful mother were finally answered? I know we used to pray for our kids. Our prayers went something like this. I pray when you have kids, your kids grow up be exactly like you. <laughs> you know, could it have been the faithful prayers of a mother? I, you know, we, we don't know. I, you know. We do know somehow, some way, God used the birth of the child in Enoch's life to bring Enoch to God and to save his soul. Listen, God uses all kinds of events in people's life to bring them to the Lord. Sometimes they're, they're touched by the thoughts of hell. Sometimes they react to the love of God. Sometimes they think of loved ones who have died and gone to heaven and they desire to be with them for eternity. Uh, you know, and still others feel guilty about their sins. The means by which God uses to draw people to himself is not important. What is important is that he draws them to himself. And the fact that he draws them is, is what's important for Enoch. Something about that birth of his son. Being the mother of Enoch could speak volumes about Cain's wife's influence in her husband and her children's lives. It, it could show her influence over her husband. Cain, Cain had lived his entire life up to this point as if he wasn't living before God. I think about Cain, and, and I'm amazed. A lot of people live like this, by the way. But I think about Cain, and one of the things that amazes me about Cain is that Cain kills his brother Abel buries his brother. God comes to Cain, says, where is your brother? Cain lies to God and says, what am I, my brother's keeper? I don't know where he's at. And God says, yes, you do. And then God confronts him with what he did. And Cain is living like God is oblivious to what's going on in the world. Like, like God has no idea what's going on in my life. God didn't see a thing. I think about him, and I think about later in the, New Te in the Old Testament, a guy like the name of Joseph, who when Potiphar's wife wants, to, wants him to be... Uh, uh, Seduced, his answer is, how could I commit such a sin before my God? Two total opposite ways of thinking. I'm acting like God doesn't even know what's going on in my life. I live that way. Or I'm living like God sees everything I do, knows all about it. How could I do these things before my God? I mean, those are two totally different ways to think. Cain had lived his life as if God didn't even know what was going on in his life. And maybe it's an indication that... Uh, by this time, Cain is beginning to have some changes. Maybe, maybe this Enoch is an indication that Cain's wife has had influence over her husband and her children. Look, we don't know. It's altogether possible she could have. Proverbs tells us a wife is a noble character who can find her. She is worth far more than rubies. Maybe that's what Cain had in this wife. Maybe he had a real jewel. The point is... If I can encourage you ladies this morning, uh, listen, never give up praying for, never give up exhibiting before your husband and your children godliness. God can use your influence in your prayers to draw your children and your husband to the Lord. Uh, here we see her influence over her children. Something happened that Enoch was raised to walk with God in a society of unspeakable wickedness. Listen, Enoch walked with God until God took him. Enoch is the first man to not experience death. God took him up into heaven. He walked with God. He was 365 years old when God took him. 65, he has a child. And 300 years later, walking with God as a godly man, the Lord takes him up into heaven. From this family comes a boy like that. Something happened. Was it her? We don't know, but I can assure you of this, that godly children and godly families don't just happen. 
They must be cultivated. D.L. Moody used to tell the story about a man who came to him and said, when the Mexican War began, he said, I wanted to enlist. My mother said, uh, I don't want you to enlist unless you become a Christian. He said, I will not become a Christian. And she prayed and prayed and tried and tried. He said, listen, mother, when the war is over, I will come back and I will consider becoming a Christian. He said, she handed him a watch and she handed him a Bible. She said, my father gave me this watch. I want you to keep it. And every time that you look at that watch, I want you to remember it at 12 o'clock. I'll be praying for you. She gave him a Bible, and the Bible was, some passages were marked in it, and some notes in the, in the leaflets that would help him to uh, be guided to some scriptures. He said, at one time on a long march, he said, uh, I pulled out that watch, and it was 12 o'clock, and he said, I remembered, I've been gone for four months, I remembered my mother saying, every day at 12 o'clock, I'll be praying for you. He said, I said to the to the sergeant in charge, he said, can I have just a minute? And he gave me a break. He said, I walked over behind a tree. I took out the Bible my mother had given to me. He said, and I cried out to the God of my mother to save me. The fact of the matter is that we thank God for mothers. Listen, none of us would be here without them. But, but we thank God for our mothers. A mother's job is, is truly never done, and especially a single mom. Uh, her job is never done. I, I believe in, uh, being a mother is the hardest job in America. It's hard enough when there's a father and a mother raising the children together, uh, but sometimes they're not together physically, and sometimes they're not together physically or spiritually. Uh, and I know there are some mothers out there and some people out there who've tried to use this, the excuse. Well, you know, you just don't understand my past. You just don't understand my family history. You just don't understand my marriage situation. But Cain's wife could have used all those excuses. But I think instead that Cain's wife chose to overcome the past and use her partnership with God and or with her husband in a way that influenced him and her children for God. Now, realistically, did Cain change? We don't know. Did, did, did Cain repent? Did he ever come to, to a, a, a saving knowledge of God? We don't know. Did any of their other children ever turn to God or walk with God? Uh, no biblical record of it. Just this one. But I believe this woman in the Bible, which we know very little about, almost nothing, the most talked about mother and wife in history, I believe that single little reference to her existence, Cain knew his wife and she bore and conceived Enoch. I think that that shows a tremendous amount of influence that she may have had in the role of a wife and a mother. She wasn't perfect, but I believe she was very influential. If Cain's wife was the kind of woman who had a godly influence over her husband and children, my prayer is that the wives and the mothers here today would desire to have that kind of influence in their homes as well. Moms, you got an incredible God-given role in the homes, in the marriages, in the life of your children. We thank you for all that you do. You are to be honored, and we do that. We honor you today on your special day for the role that you play in our lives. Was Cain's wife that kind of influential woman, that kind of woman of power, that kind of, uh, of woman that had an impact on her husband? And our children, all we know about her is what the Bible tells us about her. But we know that she gave birth to Enoch. We know that Enoch is the only one in that entire family that ever walked with God the way he did. And I think that speaks volumes to the influence of his mother. I know that today you probably could think back, many of you, on the influence of your mother. Many of you may have had godly mothers. Many of you may not have had godly mothers. The point is, you have the choice today to be the kind of mother and the kind of wife that God has called you to be. I pray that you would accept that challenge and say, Lord, make me a woman of influence, of power, a godly woman that can help my husband and help my children to be drawn to the Lord. Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you for our mothers that are here. We thank you for the mothers we had. I thank you for the godly mother I had. Lord, I ask you to bless our moms 
in their role in their jobs today because they certainly have a tough job in this world, perhaps the hardest job in the world. Help our moms today to examine their lives and say, am I the kind of godly woman that I should be? Am I a woman who influences my children so that they will seek the Lord? Am I a woman who influences my husband to be a godly man? And Father, may we turn to you for the help to make that happen if it's not so already. And so, Father, bless our mothers today. Bless them in their roles as we give you thanksgiving for them. In Christ's name. Church, I'm going to ask you to pray together with me this morning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For there is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> everywhere. Happy Mother's Day. We appreciate you. We love you. We're going to take all day to just kind of love on you and make you feel special and appreciated. Husbands, take the challenge to recognize all that you are and all that you do has an impact on your wife and your home. Ladies, understand, God's called you to be a woman of power and influence in your home, to influence your husbands to be godly men, and influence your children to seek out the Lord in their lives. As we go out into this mission field called our community, remember, people out there are looking for solutions to life's problems. The answer is in Jesus. Let them see Jesus in you, and when they do, don't leave it at that. Introduce them to Jesus so they, they may know him like you know him. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you next Sunday. Happy Mother's Day. Have a great day.